the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead with uh, uh, your talk. Thank you, Yen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Let me share my uh, screen. All right, you can see my slides okay? Oh, uh, how about now? Yeah, it works well. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for inviting me first uh, uh, for this uh, uh, monthly talk. And uh, since we don't have a lot of uh, uh, participants, I, I would uh, encourage if you have questions, just uh, just to raise your hand or just uh, cut in to ask the questions. So perhaps we can make this more of a discussion instead of I'm myself just talking here. Uh, so I will be just uh, giving uh, you a, a presentation on the Redox flow technology um, on how we in the PNL design the advanced electrolyte uh, several principles and uh, some of our uh, most recent uh, re report that came out uh, last week on the science. So um, I probably would not have time to discuss the uh, using the machine learning for the electrolyte uh, uh, design. So uh, we will see about it. Okay, so um, so I'm not quite sure about uh, uh, the audience uh, uh, familiarity with the uh, energy storage. So I will start from uh, basics. Uh, so basically um, there's a huge demand or there will be actually, there are huge demand for energy storages. There are several uh, predictions like uh, uh, Wood Zinc uh, uh, and Bloomingberg Energy Report. And also ESA also reported the significant increase of the energy storage for the for the grid. For example, for the from the Bloomingberg, they reported they projected that there will be a lead of 500 gigawatt hour by 2040. So that's equivalent to the capacity of uh, uh, 75 Hoover dams, and we are not going to build even one Hoover dams, right? There is a even uh, discussing that it take uh, 20, 30 years just to get a permission for building a hydro, hydropower dam. So uh, it's uh, uh, the, de the development on the hydro dam will be very limited. We have to come up with some other ways to satisfy this need. And actually this number is before the uh, Biden administration and uh, with the new administration, they proposed the, that they uh, the goal is to decarbonize the energy sector by 2035. That's uh, probably uh, this number will and it go up. So if we, we assume this number is correct and we assume that uh, uh, out of the system, system level, we can reach 100 watt hour per kilogram. It's a modest number. Uh, and by that number, we will need a five million metric tons of batteries. So it's a lot of uh, materials just by the sheer uh, number of it. And none of the current technology can satisfy this uh, demand alone. And on the other side, our technology is quite, not quite there yet to satisfy the energy storage. So the, um, the, the diagram on the right side show, showing here that we have a program at a ping called Battery 500. Some of you probably heard that is many development for the um, for the um, transportation uh, batteries, but also on the grid energy storage side, uh, the requirement actually is even uh, more stringent because we are not only required to research to reach is a cost to go, but also they are. Uh, have a, a lot longer uh, cycle life requirement because when we talk about uh, grid energy storage, talk about a grid investment, we are talking about 20, 30 years. Uh, it's not like a car, you change your car maybe every five, 10 years, but for grid, we need the battery to last a whole lot longer. So uh, the particular alternative to the uh, Nissan batteries that is currently most widely used in the in the in the uh, energy storage market is this one called a redox flow battery. Uh, probably some of you are not very familiar with this technology. So basically, in this technology, the energy is carried by electrolyte instead of by uh, uh, in the electrode. 
uh, like it is in the in the lithium batteries, uh, where you have um, uh, most of the time you have graphite as anode and uh, and then uh, NMS, AM, NMC or NCO as the as the cathode that actually store the energy. But in this in the case of redox flow batteries, the energy is stored in the electrolyte. Oh, let me see if we can. Uh, the the elect the energy is actually uh, stored in the in the electrolyte, uh, and this electrolyte is being pumped through the stack where is a reaction chamber. The redox reaction happens, and then the the conversion between the uh, electron and uh, electric energy and chemical energy uh, happened inside this uh, compartment. So because of of this configuration, there's some major difference between the redox flow battery and other solid state batteries. First of all, the power and energy is decoupled, so you can design your battery uh, based on different power and energy uh, requirement, which is actually a very attractive uh, 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 characteristic for the for the grid energy storage. Because in the grid energy storage, there's a lot of different uh, power and energy requirement for different applications. It's not like in the transportation uh, transportation market. And the most, when we talk about uh, 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 aqueous flow battery, there's high safety because the major uh, constituent uh, water, and uh, there's normally no fire of, uh, uh, no risk of fire and explosion, and it can be designed as a modular, so we can add up to a bigger system. Uh, one major drawback, however, is a, uh, uh, is a, uh, sorry, kind of messed up. Oh, I just talked about this. Yeah, so um, the, the, the reason we we'll want to use this is because of high safety, also the, uh, the decoupling of the power and the energy. And also, um, I, I don't know if you noticed, there's a recent paper on science uh, called out what we do with the dead batteries. Basically, uh, a lot of uh, uh, with the penetration of the EV environment, uh, EV uh, market, uh, there's a lot of uh, cost after EV uh, electric cost after their service life. There's a battery left there, and how we are going to do about it? The recycling of Nissan battery actually cost a lot. But in the case of redox flow battery, because you are not actually using the material, the material is do, is dissolved in the uh, electrolyte. It's just going through the redox reactions, so you can actually uh, recycle them. Uh, that's one major difference. Another difference is the safety we just mentioned. Yeah, there has been quite a bit of a Nissan battery uh, fire and explosion from South Korea, also from uh, Enterprise in Arizona as well. Uh, those are all very severe uh, pop, uh, fire accident on large scales. Um, so yeah, one major drawback for the uh, redox flow battery is a low energy density. This figure we published in 2014 and it has not changed in March. So we basically mapped out uh, uh, electron concentration and the cell voltage of, uh, of most of the uh, flow batteries. And you can see most of them are below the true flow batteries, meaning two liquid electrolyte uh, below 50 watt hour per liter. And uh, with uh, hybrid, some hybrid systems a little higher, uh, close to 100 watt hour per liter. So for the lithium batteries, the, the low energy density lithium battery, the one based on the graphite and uh, um, lithium iron phosphate is somewhere around 200 watt hour per liter. So you can see uh, the energy density is much lower for the redox flow battery. And this is open related to this. Uh, number, this concentration of the active materials. So open related to its stability at a different temperature window. You have to stabilize uh, them in your operation temperature window. Uh, so that gives you a, a, a functional, a, a functional uh, concentration. Um, so, they, so, so just give you an idea how no inner density that is. So this is an uh, um, uh, early attempt to build a large uh, uh, polysulfide bromide uh, uh, flow battery. This is the first uh, uh, large scale energy demonstration. This is, I think it's around just a five megawatt system. And the, the size of the tank here is as big as two uh, Olympic uh, swimming pools. 
So those are the huge systems. And so our uh, work in PNL actually uh, focused on developing high energy density electrolyte. Uh, so as I said before, basically we want to stabilize the uh, high concentration electrolyte at a wider temperature. It's uh, normally the energy density is associated with uh, how stable the electrolyte will be at the temperature range of your choice. So. Uh, we started with understand uh, uh, the solvation of the high concentration electrolyte. This is a, uh, one error that is uh, uh, kind of lacking of the research. Uh, it's not also lacking of theoretical uh, support as well. We don't have a whole lot of understanding on why, how the electrolyte behave with, uh, once the concentration of the electrolytes uh, getting to, to a pretty high level. Uh, and then we came up with several different ways to design higher uh, energy density uh, uh, electrolyte, include the design the contact iron pair, disrupt the cluster reformation, device <laughs> professional uh, uh, salvation. So uh, to make it fun, I started with all, choose all the words, start with D. And so I'm gonna just briefly talk about uh, a couple of examples how we use those methods to stabilize the electrolyte. So the first one is vanadium electrolyte, uh, and uh, vanadium has a has an issue that its electrolyte is not very stable, and it's in the in the opposite way. Uh, by that I mean the vanadium four, uh, five will precipitate at a high temperature, and then the two, three, four. Uh, the, 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 this is a five, the orange one is five. The, uh, the, uh, the purple, green, and the blue one is the two, three, four. The two, three, four is actually precipitated at a low temperature. So they behave uh, in operate ways. And we started with vanadium five. And uh, here you can say the, uh, the vanadium NMR, when you heating it up and cooling it down, it doesn't really come back out of the same way. It, it, it's suggesting that the bonding environmental changes. It's not a, no longer a reversible uh, process. And then the DFT calculation suggests that when you when it gain some energy at a high temperature, it can go through a deprotonation process. Uh, this water can kick out a proton, and then it become a high, basically from a hydro hydroxide be forming a hydrooxide and this guy uh, will, uh, um, will eventually uh, polymerize and then uh, precipitate out. Uh, so here is some evidence using the uh, nickel the same. Uh, so uh, we put the electrolyte in this uh, uh, liquid chamber and uh, uh, bombarded with uh, a bismuth iron beam and it uses a, a a uh, second, uh, uh, secondary iron uh, mass spec to, to try to find what is the species inside. So you can see here, this is the original vanadium electrolyte. They actually have a lot of higher order uh, vanadium uh, oxide species. Electrolyte, those species is actually the uh, primary source needs to the precipitation. So uh, this is uh, a theoretical understanding, current uh, most of the understanding on um, why the vanadium-5 precipitate out. There are several different uh, process. Uh, one is deprotonation we just uh, mentioned, and then you will, uh, once it deprotonated, it's easy to uh, di dimerize, and then this dimer will further form the clustering from a bigger uh, clustering and then eventually precipitate out at a V205 solid, uh, just the oxide. So there's a couple of ways to uh, present uh, the precipitation from happening. First is to prevent this deprotonation. And the second one is to prevent the clustering from, from happening. So basically keeps the vanadium five species further from each other. Uh, and the first way, the first effort was to form a, try to form a contact iron. Uh, so I would call it a design a contact, a contact iron pair. So in our case, uh, what we did is we know there's a deprotonation process that's because of the vanadium shear electron with this oxygen. So to prevent this electron shearing, we introduced another uh, iron in, in our case, we Introduce the HCl, so the chloride has a higher tendency to share electron with vanadium. So, in that case, uh, once there's a 
enough of chloride, this vanadium is actually will, will leave this water intact. So this new species uh, has a much higher concentration and stability window. Uh, so there, here, this uh, improvement, uh, energy density improved by more than 70%. Uh, the traditional sulfuric acid uh, uh, electrolyte can go in a about somewhere between one, lower than 1.5 molar of the vanadium concentration. Uh, and with a mixed acid, we can go all the way to 2 or 2.5 molar. And the temperature window also increased a lot. The traditional one, normally you have to operate it between 5 to 30. 30 degrees, so it's pretty much like a human being. Uh, outside of uh, that uh, temperature, you have to uh, pair the system with uh, air conditioning. So there's a significant amount of the parasitic loss on the efficiency. Uh, with this uh, new electrolyte, it can go actually all the way from minus 20 degree uh, all the way to 60 or 70 degree. I can't remember the exact number, but uh, uh, with this new species, um, you can uh, just have a standalone system. You don't need to actively control the temperature. And then we demonstrate this in our lab, make a, lot, a larger system, one kilowatt system, and this technology license to uh, several companies. Um, so that's one way uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can stabilize the vanadium electrolyte. This is uh, another uh, example, also using the design, the contact of, uh, iron pair to stabilize the, this time is the zinc iodide electrolyte. So this is the attempt to generate a high energy density flow batteries. So you remember I showed the, uh, showed the uh, diagram that most of them are lower energy density. So the idea we came up with is to uh, use the zinc paired with, uh, with, uh, with iodide, right? Uh, the iodine we know it barely dissolving water, but uh, when, there's excess iodide there, it will form triiodide. And this triiodide actually have a, a very high uh, solubility. So uh, close to seven molar in, in water. So that translated to three, more than 300 watt hour per liter. So close to the, the uh, volumetric energy density of the Nissan batteries. And we paired it with zinc in attempt to eliminate uh, another uh, charge carrier uh, charge carrier ions because the zinc itself can function you know, as both uh, active materials and also uh, as the charge carrier species. And so we indeed uh, showing here, uh, we can go, this is a cycling performance as 3.5 molar. And this figure actually is the, the here we can actually cycle it out of five molar. So with five molar, uh, of the zinc iodide, it's actually have, have 10 molar of the iodide concentration. The charge discharge um, uh, cycle is very difficult because of the significant growth of the zinc dendrite at this high concentration. Uh, but anyway, we showed that you can do the charge discharge and the, the energy density is close to the low end Nisman batteries. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is this system also have a precipitate issue uh, the electrolyte will precipitate at no temperature. Uh, once it go down to zero, it precipitate even at a much lower uh, concentration. And we did the NMO test on the zinc. It shows actually it's not a concentration effect. At 100%, is a, the zinc iodide is, they have a totally different uh, uh, concentration uh, signal that not follow, the, follow this, uh, uh, this line. So uh, in the end, what we found is actually the triiodide when they dissolve in the water, uh, it's a happy symmetrical structure. But once you introduce another uh, cation, uh, in our case, the zinc, it actually will strain this bond. It will actually then strip one iodide from this triiodide structure and it left the two, it will leave two uh, iodides to form the iodine and iodine has a low, uh, it does not dissolve in water, so it will precipitate out. And this is an uh, extrathermal reaction, so that's why it happens at a low temperature. So very similarly, if you can uh, prevent the, uh, uh, the complexing between the iodide and the zinc, you will be able to stabilize it. And so once we understand, it's pretty simple, actually. We introduced a, a simple ethanol alcohol, and that will complex with the zinc. Uh, so this uh, here, here is showing the, the different uh, NMR signals of the zinc 
uh, with and without ethanol, you can see the, uh, the changes. And with this addition, or you can try the ethylene glycol as well. So uh, they are actually much more stable at different uh, concentrations. Here's their cycling performance. So this is two examples on how we uh, design the, uh, the contact iron pairs to generate a high energy density uh, uh, electrolyte. And the next one is how, to, how we design uh, additive to sort of disrupt the cluster reformation formation of the vanadium uh, electrolyte. So the additive we choose is manganese chloride and uh, um, ammonium hydrogen phosphate. And uh, uh, so uh, this is a very complicated uh, system. The reason being that when we try to stabilize the vanadium electrolyte, we have to stabilize uh, all four different valence of them. If you just uh, stabilize one, one uh, ion, one valence state, it won't work because they, the flow bar the batteries always cycle between these four different valence. So uh, we we have we have we found that by uh, using this combination of these two uh, additives, it will it can stabilize all four different uh, uh, vanadium ions at a higher concentration and a wider temperature, and uh, some of them mechanisms are still under under study. Uh, but in terms of disrupt as a cluster reformation, we have a clear evidence. So this is the uh, um, Raman uh, spectroscopy. We, we put the uh, electrolyte uh, under high temperature and to check the uh, VOV uh, bond formation, which is somewhere around this uh, 800 peaks. So uh, uh, th this big hump is when it exists in the, in the liquid and then it will gradually split into two peaks that are basically basically suggest that the uh, VOV, found, uh, VOV bond uh, formed. So basically they, they started to clustering. And uh, so you can say with the additive, the, the, the time it takes to form this bond is a lot longer, about uh, almost 10 times longer that, that suggests our uh, um, uh, uh, mechanism of disrupt the cluster formation is 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 in working, and other evidence include again the same data uh, that the this is a red one is the um the data with the additives so you can say by just merely uh look at these two two spectrums that is the uh the one with sorry. Uh, the one with the additive has a lot less higher order vanadium oxide. And this is a comparison of, the, of, of this same, same data present in a different way. So here is the performance. So uh, uh, basically by using this by additive, we can stabilize the vanadium at two molar at a much also at a wider temperature range. So here's the improvement. Uh, uh, this technology also has been uh, licensed to uh, several companies. So I'm going to uh, also talk about a little bit uh, on how we uh, made the transition to the organic systems. So, so to hopefully give you a bigger picture on the field, this, how this field has developed over the last several years. So this is, uh, uh, so in addition to the mature development, we also have uh, group working on the device development. So they came up with this, uh, from this flow through design to this uh, uh, interdigitated design. I believe some, some of you are from a uh, fuel cell field, uh, should be very familiar with this design. It's not a new thing, but we adopted in the, uh, from, uh, from the fuel cell technology to uh, flow battery technology. So basically by doing this, we can uh, reduce the pressure drop because now the electrolyte flow uh, instead of cross the whole distance, it will just cross this uh, this rib, this rib uh, a much shorter distance. So that way we can uh, flow the electrolyte a lot faster with lower pressure drop and then reduce the concentration polarization. So by doing that, we actually can uh, Im improve the uh, current density of the flow battery uh, originally from uh, somewhere between 50 to 80 milliamp uh, centimeter square. When we started doing this at a time around 2010, 
And by last couple of years, we can actually all the way reach 400 milliamp hour per centimeter square and keep, uh, still keep overall uh, energy efficiency at uh, over 75%. Well, that's a good development, but the, the issue with that development is actually changes the cost of the distribution. So you can see here, this bigger, bigger circle that's in 2010, when we run it at a 50 milliamp hour per centimeter square. So you can see the membrane cost is, is a huge part of it. Uh, the membrane normally in the vanadium, you have to use napium membrane. So uh, it's a bit expensive. But as we uh, increase the current density, we make uh, we were we are able to make the stack a lot of smaller for the same power. So now the membrane is an eight percent uh, at a four hundred milliamp per centimeter square. And now at this time, the chemical cost, which basically is the uh, vanadium cost, is almost sixty percent. So we have to kind of shift our research direction because. Uh, if we keep going down this way, the return will be very limited. There's no way we can change the price of the vanadium, right? That's not a research topic. So, um, so yeah, so the membrane cost uh, has reduced a lot and the primary cost driver is the vanadium, the chemical cost. So we have to look for other lower cost uh, redox couples. And if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at the um, potential window, as well as the availability and the cost and the toxicity of the uh, redox active metal ions, uh, there's really uh, not much of choice. Uh, iron chromium is a good pair, but the issue is, is crossover and the chromium is, uh, uh, is, not, uh, is too close to the hydrogen uh, potential. It's normally generate a hydrogen, uh, general hydrogen gas in the iron chromium system. Uh, so the idea now is to uh, switch to organic based redox couples. Uh, the rational being like uh, uh, the organic couple right now is probably more expensive, uh, but uh, hopefully with further development, the, the cost will come down. So with that kind of uh, realization, our first system, is it, this is actually our second system. Our first system was not very good. So this, the second system we worked on is a Philizen. And uh, uh, this, is the, the, this is the Philizen structure. Uh, it's a, it's a cofactor in the human body. Uh, and it's being widely used in a pharmaceutical company. I believe the cost is also very low. Uh, but the problem is uh, we know that it's uh, from other research that it has a very good redox, uh, uh, redox behaviors. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't dissolve in water. So for us, it's not gonna work. We have to dissolve in the water to, um, uh, to make it into a functional electrolyte. So how are we gonna functionalize it? Uh, there's many, many ways to functionalize it, right? Uh, and so our organic chemist came up with this uh, eight different ways to functionalize this. And we don't wanna uh, you know, go out just to about synthesize everything. So we did a little bit of uh, theoretical calculation. We can't predict its solubility. It's way too difficult to do that. I, I think it's at the current level uh, stage, we only be able to predict the solubility. Uh, but we were able to predict that they calculate the solvation energy. And by comparing of that, we know uh, maybe which one we can synthesize first. So it came back indeed that we found that the functionalization can uh, change two different things. One is it moves the potential of the, of the, uh, of the filizen, actually most of them to the elective side. And then there are different solvation energies, the number five or seven, the one with uh, uh, carboxylic uh, acid and the sulfonic acid uh, derivative give you a higher uh, sol solvation energy. And we synthesized those materials as they actually came back uh, as we uh, predicted. Um, here is, uh, there's uh, the synthesized steps. The characterization side, we found that the, um, there are difference, uh, actually the DHP, although the solubility is very low, it's actually have a have a most beautiful CV peaks. Uh, the other two with uh, um, uh, sulfonic acid and the carboxylic acid, the, the solubility is high, but, uh, but the uh, reversibility is actually uh, not as good. Uh, the peak separation is actually pretty significant. 
this is the one weird thing I still don't understand yet. Those uh, uh, molecules can be perfectly used in the flow battery, but in the CV, their peak separation is actually pretty big. And this is was this is, this phenomenon also uh, observed on the materials from other groups as well. Uh, so eventually we choose this uh, one with sulfuric acid. We call it DHPS, I believe, uh, because of the uh, high solubility. It reaches uh, 1.45 with two electrons. That's almost three more of the electron density. That's higher than any uh, energy uh, any uh, flow battery reported before. So here is the uh, NMR study, which uh, again suggested this phenomenon called the uh, uh, preferential salvation. Uh, which basically means that uh, uh, when we uh, change it, when we, uh, when we modify the DHPS, uh, DH, the phillies then become DHPS with this sulfonic group, the major interaction, uh, the, the, line, uh, the, the chemical shift is actually coming from the number one, two, three on this side. So uh, it's actually the proton on this side intensify the interaction with the water, with the solvent uh, a lot. Uh, that's what we, we observed. So basically by per preferential salvation basically means in some preferential position of the structures, you uh, create uh, uh, your chemical entity to intensify the dynamic uh, uh, change, a uh, dynamic exchange ways between the uh, uh, your solvent so you can uh, reach a higher uh, uh, concentration, higher solubility. So, uh, and this, the B figure is when it's at 1.4 molar, so it's almost uh, uh, for the sodium uh, uh, NMR, you almost can see close to the, uh, the, the solid state. Uh, um, uh, uh, close to the solid state uh, at, at that point, at that concentration, because it's show up this causal uh, splitting for the uh, signal of the sodium. And here is the performance. Uh, it was uh, pretty good at, at, at the time of the report. Uh, we report 500 uh, uh, cycles with uh, modest uh, capacity decay. At that time, it's actually pretty, pretty, um, pretty uh, stable. Uh, so that's uh, uh, actually the three different ways I introduced uh, to stabilize those. Uh, I didn't talk about Ferris, uh, Ferrisen. Ferrisen is a long acre system. So I, I kind of uh, um, uh, limit this talk in our all the acres work. But in the, uh, in the Ferrisen system, it also has this uh, preferential uh, solvation that you can create through the design of molecules. So anyway, uh, what we find is actually you can uh, need to create some kind of a symmetry in the molecular structure to increase its uh, solubility. And that's uh, uh, actually uh, from the basic uh, thermodynamics, it's kind of uh, uh, easy to understand, right? When you increase the solubility, you need to increase the uh, entropy. And uh, then if you have some sort of uh, anisotropy in your structure, you, you create a, a more disorder in the in the uh, electrolyte that accommodate more um, materials to give you higher uh, solubility. So that's uh, uh, that's that, and then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, our newest development on the filarin core structure. This is another uh, excitement uh, uh, development uh, that we we follow up on our previous study on the filizen. So the filizen and all the other uh, organic structure that uh, has been reported so far in this field all has one problem is their stability is not very good. Uh, you know, we showed the 500 cycle, the 500 cycle is actually only around uh, probably just a little over two weeks. That's kind of the state of art. Before uh, this filizen work, most of the battery cycling around two weeks, and then they you will start to show a uh, very significant material degradation uh, because just because the organic material is not stable in the, uh, in, uh, in that electrolyte environment. And also it's not stable when you repetitively uh, induce, uh, apply a voltage swing on it in during charge and discharge. So actually in every cycle, you're actually 
kind of electrochemically synthesize some new materials that uh, you don't even know. So that's a major issue. Uh, and this filiation structure that we started to take notice on this because we have a pre pre previously have a work on uh, this work in, in 2015, we did it in the lung aqueous. Uh, the structure itself is actually pretty uh, stable uh, because of the pi conjugated uh, structure. Uh, but uh, the issue is uh, it's uh, in the water, it has a big problem because uh, uh, the, when it being reduced to alcohol and then it will, uh, it will, uh, uh, it, it, then you need a kind of a, a catalyst or some uh, a chemical oxidant to bring it back. Uh, so the way we uh, did it is we're trying to see if we can using through the functionalization, we can make this uh, uh, between the ketone and alcohol uh, a reversible uh, redox reaction through the hydrogenation and dehydrogenation. So that's the goal of this research. And uh, so here is kind of a starting point of this, uh, uh, the ketone uh, material we choose of foreigner. So when, when the orange CV is the foreigner in the acetyl nitrile with zero water, and you can see perfectly two peaks, right? Two redox peaks, uh, the very two beautiful peaks. And as you uh, add water, the the uh, this peak started to disappear. You still can see the first one, but the second one is start to disappear. And if you put it in the battery or uh, aqueous battery, then it started to lose uh, uh, lose uh, capacity quickly. There's actually a group reporting on that, but they couldn't get a uh, and the capacity after six or 10 cycles. Um, so the reason being that once it's reduced and there's a, a protonation and after the protonation, they, you needed to, this is theoretical calculation, if the calculation that you needed to over one volt uh, to, to bring it back. And uh, then uh, for the, in the battery condition, for the anode side, it's just impossible to do that. So our uh, assumption was, uh, uh, so this is basically caused by the protonation of that reduced species, right? So if we can uh, change the pKa of the uh, foreignone, then we might be able to keep it deprotonated. If we can keep it deprotonated, then the voltage will, the potential will not be so high. We might be still able to do the uh, redox reaction. So uh, we came up with those uh, whole lot of uh, different uh, uh, structures and most of them are uh, adding the electron withdrawal group to lower the pKa. Uh, there's one that we did the opposite direction that increased the pKa, which actually, of course, showed a much worse uh, result. So uh, you can see here, we, uh, we actually then found uh, when the first one uh, is, uh, it is uh, we are actually if they uh, we actually possible to also stabilize the the uh, the proton on the carbon the CH bond, so that will give us actually two uh, hydrogenation two electrons through the uh, hydrogenation and the dehydrogenation of these two uh, protons. So. Um, Oh, this is the evidence of the NMR. We showed the uh, uh, exchange confirmed that the deprotonation uh, in the acres, so we uh, can prevent that protonation from uh, uh, happening. Uh, this also uh, showed that there's a comproportionation reaction. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So basically in this figure, uh, when we mix the charged uh, uh, product, not charged, the chemically prepared fluorino and fluorino OH, we actually observed that they are radicals. So uh, here is the uh, performance. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, cycling at the room temperature at 20 milliampere per centimeter square. We actually can stably cycle it for more than uh, four months. That's more than uh, 1100 cycles. Uh, so this is uh, the, so far the best performance in, in this era. Uh, and the more importantly, uh, another issue is uh, most of the current uh, organic flow batteries, they have to be cycled in uh, uh, nitrogen or argon filled glue box. Uh, if you cycle in the air, then their degre degradation will be a lot faster. 
Uh, so we actually subject uh, one uh, other cell uh, outside of the glow box and, uh, and uh, bring it also up to higher temperature of 50 degrees C uh, because most of the flu battery when they're in operating, the cell temperature is about uh, 10 or 15 degrees higher than ambient temperature because of all the uh, efficiency loss. Uh, and the, so uh, I think uh, we are the first group that demonstrate an organic um, pure that can be cycled on the uh, outside of uh, glow box and as well as also at an elevated temperature. So we actually uh, cycle this cell for about six, 700 uh, cycles. It shows a, a decent uh, uh, cycle life. Uh, the capacity decay is faster than the cycling at room temperature, but that mostly is caused by uh, the higher temperature, the castle light in our case is a Fahrenheit light, is actually has a higher uh, tendency of crossover because of the uh, increased, uh, uh, increased uh, iron mobility. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, increase uh, iron ability. So there's a lot of more uh, byron cyanide crossover from castellite to the analyte that's contributed to the higher uh, capacity decay. Um, so, and this uh, here is the voltage profile show you the, how the, how the, um, how the uh, charge discharge performance goes. Um, and this, but this system has a very uh, weird performance, or not, I should not say weird, uh, unconventional uh, behavior if you com compare it to other flow batteries. In, in fact, yeah, compared to other flow batteries. So uh, on the right side is expected as we are uh, lower the PKA of the uh, active materials, its reversibility should increase because uh, uh, the deprotonation is, uh, the, the trend is towards uh, the reversibility. So this is the one we uh, expected. But on the left side, this is a performance I don't, we don't expect it. So this is the same material, but cycling at a different uh, concentration. So you can see uh, the, this is all, oh, by the way, this is all discharge uh, capacity for this, for the battery. So we are using the uh, battery as the, battery discharge capacity sort of as a measure of the reversibility of this material inside the functional battery. Uh, so you can see the, for, uh, for the um, higher concentration of the material, it has better reversibility. You can discharge the uh, battery at a much higher current density and have a much higher discharge capacity. So this is not a normal. Normally, uh, the reversibility is not related to the concentration, right? It's a, it's a, uh, it's an intrinsic property. It's a thermodynamic property. Uh, but in this case, this is what we observed that is actually changing uh, ways and increase ways the concentration. And so, based on that and other factors, we propose a new uh, mechanism. So inside of this, uh, when you charge and discharge, there is actually not only uh, two, uh, uh, not only electron, uh, electrochemical reactions, so there's also a chemical reaction that uh, uh, of disproportionation uh, in, the, in the charge and then comproportionation in the discharge. So basically, during the charge is a radical ion generated because of uh, uh, electrochemical charge that will be consumed chemically, go back to this uh, uh, original form of fluorino through this reaction of disproportionation. Uh, in the discharge, the radical ion consumed uh, by this way uh, of the electrochemically consumed will actually generate uh, chemically. So it's uh, the two electron reaction of the uh, hydrogenation and dehydrogenation is actually enabled by this uh, chemical reaction of uh, uh, disproportionation. And uh, there are, um, there's still, uh, some factors we don't know yet. Uh, this current research is still trying to figure out all the steps of the uh, charge discharge mechanism. So I think that's all I have uh, uh, for this talk. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, my uh, primary funding is from DOE Office of uh, Electricity. Uh, all Office of Electricity from their uh, energy storage program, and they are also supported by the PLC Energy Storage uh, Materials uh, Initiative.
Uh, here's my uh, team member and my past team members, all the work that's done by them actually. So uh, with that, I will conclude my talk and, uh, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take an, uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so we can, we are now open for questions. Uh, so anyone from audience uh, have questions for Wei? You can, I think, I believe you can unmute yourself or you can put your question in the chat. Okay, can I ask Guido Pez? Can I ask? Uh, um, sure, sure, go ahead. Lots of, there's a lot of computational work involved here in, in uh, you know, in, in, in uh, predicting uh, solvated species. Now, I was it to note that, that you say you do the um, geometry optimization with a concurrent uh, use of solvation model. In other words, I believe you said you do the geometry of optimization within the solvation model. Is that right? Uh, for the Fidelian work? Uh, the, this optimization is done by DFT. So, um, yeah, yes, but you, you, you said you do it within a solvation model. In other words, you, you're not you're not using you're not starting with the gas phase molecule. You you you're, you're doing a yeah. I I don't think there's a with uh, this is just uh, in the gas phase calculated the solvation energy. Yeah, this is a this is not a explicit. Uh, it doesn't consider. It's not a uh, considering the interaction with the solvent. So oh, this okay. is a pure uh, solvation energy. We are not uh, at the point that we can calculate the solubility yet. Okay, but but in, in previous slides, you said that you, you used a particular model for doing uh, geometry optimization with a concurrent use of solvation. That, that, that's what struck me. You know, instead uh, of applying solvation afterwards and so on, I, 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 I think you called it a Daimler model or something. I, I, it's, it's on your slide. Uh, initially, in the beginning, towards the beginning. Towards the beginning. So, which system? I, I, I don't recall, but I remember the model. I remember you distinctly said that you're doing. Uh, with, That's yeah, uh, too far. Okay. Uh, uh, distinctly said that you're doing. You're doing the vanadium uh, system. Uh, well, you, you, you're doing um, uh, geometry optimization. Uh, while at the same time, uh, we, we, in the context of a solvation model, in other words, not taking the molecule and then measuring solvation and then look for applying a solvation model, but you're doing it at the same time. Uh, uh, I don't, actually, I don't think we have a solvation model yet. Most of our uh, optimization is done by DFT calculation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, anyway, that's what can I ask you another question? To what extent is, is ionic conductivity important? I mean, ohmic resistance is very, very important in fuel cells, but what, what, what's it like in these cells? Um, I would think it's not as sensitive as in fuel cells because our current density is not that high. Uh, the fuel cells is on the amping level, right? We are still on several hundred of mini amperes. So uh, the conductivity is important uh, but probably not as critical as it is now in the uh, fuel cell. Okay, so you're only at a few hundred milliamps uh, per cell, right? Okay. Right, and uh, this is a liquid, so it's naturally um, actually the conductivity is not as good as uh, as it's in the in the fuel cell system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, of, of course, proton system is a lot better than the uh, neutral system or alkaline system. Uh, as it's uh, reflected in the vanadium system, you can go several hundred mini ampere per centimeter square, but uh, for other system, most of them must be somewhere around a, a less than 100 mini ampere per centimeter square. The other thing, the, you still have, of course, a Napion membrane, right? The Napion membrane must get quite thick in the presence of all that water. Is that right? 
yeah, it, it will. Swell. It must swell a lot. Yeah, yeah. it will hydrate it. Yeah. And most of the flow battery right now is using 212, so it's not too bad. How, how thick does it get? I mean, it, it, it's, it's not, normally it's like 40 microns or something, but what does what it, does it get really thick? Or maybe you can't even measure it because it's so thick. Oh, we never measured it. I mean, if you use a 212, that's a, a two mil, right? 50, 50 minute, 50, uh, if you, 50 uh, microns. So if you know the, how uh, volume expansion of the Nafion when it's fully saturated, you can, uh, you can measure that. So I, I think it's less of a problem than it's in fuel cell because uh, uh, the water concentration in our electrolyte is actually lower than the, the water being used in fuel cell, right? In pan fuel. Cell. Oh, really? Okay. That's, that's surprising. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the active material concentration is two or three molar. So the leftover water is much, no, much less than it in pure water. Huh. Okay. Thank you. Is there are some questions in the chat. Uh, this one probably you could not see it. I can read it for you. These flow batteries need variable redox states. Could they look at the other multivalent uh, ions uh, like manganese? Uh, this, uh, I don't know, the OS, that's the uh, element OS used as a redox couple. It, 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 yeah, but, the vanadium is a multi uh, uh, valent. Uh, Transition metal iron. Uh, there are people using manganese, but uh, yeah, it's not a, a very popular uh, redox couple. I think it has uh, quite some issues. But yeah, you are right. You can use this multivalence. Actually, the use of vanadium is a breakthrough in the redox for battery. Yeah. <clears throat> so, other question is uh, uh, what does the uh, magnesium chloride do? So when we expect that uh, uh, the two plus charge state to be stabilized, but what species would stabilize uh, three plus, four plus, five plus state? Uh, that's a good From question. The phosphate anion species? Yeah, so um, the phosphate is primarily working on the, on the, uh, uh, on the vanadium five and uh, ammonia is actually a non-coordinating uh, iron. So all it serves is to sort of uh, weakly bonding with that. Uh, uh, there's a vanadium uh, uh, oxide uh, double bonding, double bonded uh, vanadium that uh, sort of uh, 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 surrounding there to prevent it from uh, 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 dimerize. Uh, as for the manganese chloride, uh, the role is we are still not very uh, clear yet. We tried quite a bit of other inorganic salt and actually and they, the manganese, uh, uh, manganese chloride works. And there's also uh, 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 also uh, 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 the chloride we believe it's function uh, as uh, sort of uh, um, maybe just as in the mixed acid that it function with complex with vanadium five, uh, but for the manganese we don't know for sure yet. This is actually a very complex system. Yeah, there's uh, other questions. Uh, maybe you are able to see it in the chat. Okay. Uh, one, um, so Luis asked a few questions. Slide five. Uh, uh, sorry, wrong way. Slide five. In uh, slide five, triple D, how does the heat capacity affect in the cooling and heating process? Are you talking about this NMR? So Louise, maybe you can, yeah. Yeah, I, that's my question. Because you have your vanadium oxide, right? So I'm asking, because of the different oxidation number, so if you have different uh, oxidation numbers, let me just say X and the oxygen is Y, they will have a different uh, heat capacity. My question, does that- oh. Uh, yeah, 
Uh, no, I think that's a minor effect because uh, uh, there's a lot of water in the electrolyte. Oh, because oh, your water is the major one to absorbing or releasing heat. Okay. Yeah, so the water has a very good, uh, you know, heat mm -hmm. capacity. So I doubt we never. Uh, we first of all, we never did that uh, research. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but I doubt you will. The the heat capacity of the different vanadium uh, valence oxide will affect that because compared to water, vanadium will be the minority in the electrolyte. Okay. And also uh, related, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was just looking at your second question. Because I, I think the vanadium oxide, if it's a precipitate, I think it should be the osmotic layer yeah. structure. Yeah, it's, uh, I didn't show the picture here. It's just a regular V205. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't have any new things there. Oh, okay. Because I'm seeing yeah. possibly because I'm seeing this this is the structure. So you have a it's a full, this is to look like a, a tetrahedral planar structure because you have five oxygen. This one is above because I, I see the different one. This is tetrahedral structure. This is do we call it a tetrahedral planar structure? But anyway, you have different structures. I'm thinking of different different crystalline. <laughs> crystalline. This is probably just yeah. This is probably just because of the DFT, the structure uh, modification uh, optimization. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not really. Okay. It's different from just the V two or five. It's a no, when when it precipitated out, it it's just a regular V two or five crystal. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can even see it. It's a reddish uh, orangey crystal. Uh -huh. okay. Uh, slide eleven, right? Yeah, that this is just a pure, pure curiosity because I see you have zinc isotope. I see zinc seventy some seventy something. Eleven, I think. Uh, I wait, did we never ever use? It? Oh yeah, that's for to do the zinc uh, uh, AMR, yeah. Yeah, I think you have the 70 states. Uh, yeah, I don't remember this number because I, I, I'm thinking the neutron effect on the electrochemistry, possibly possibly that's not your intention. Mm, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I may, I'm, I'm thinking something else. The very yeah, the, uh -huh. mm, yeah, the intention is here that uh, you say when you the concentration increase, it uh, started with a leaner uh, behavior, and the, when it fully saturated, uh, uh, all of a sudden the uh, signal jumped down to here. Oh. So uh, it, it 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 basically means that it's not a solubility. The precipitation is not a solubility effect. It's because something else happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. The the very last question is related to your organic uh, organic compound because. Uh -huh. I'm thinking if you have more proton, do you think that the current density can be increased? Oh, this is in the alkaline system. Alkaline. Oh, because I have heard you mentioned uh, you mentioned that it's in an acidic condition is better. Maybe I messed up or something. It, yeah, uh, acidic. The the vanadium system is acidic. Uh, they um, currently most of the organic system they actually are aligned uh, alkaline system dissolving see here one molar sorry one molar of uh, sodium hydroxide actually it's probably more acid more basic than that oh because I see you have this oh sorry you have carboxylic acid have seven eight dihydroxyphenidine or carboxylic acid. Oh, that, that will not give you much of the acid. Oh. Uh, yeah, this is an alkaline electrolyte. What, what I'm thinking, originally I'm thinking, so if in your molecule you have, I'm just a little bit random, but if you have the molecule, you have more carboxylic groups, just, in, just imagine you have a little more carboxylic group. You may have a little, so this is what else oh, can I cannot draw it. Sorry, just that I'm thinking tricarboxylic based compound. 
Do you think that, that could be useful? Uh, it could be. Uh -huh. You have to synthesize the problem is so with uh, the, 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 the problem posed here is uh, so for the Philidon itself is it actually has more than 6000 derivatives. Uh, so you can try all kinds of derivatives. The question is under the limited time and the resource, which one do you try? So that's why we did this uh, uh, theoretical calculation. Uh, we have our uh, organic scientists uh, uh, sort of uh, screen at first, the proposed couple of structures that potentially have higher uh, solubility. And then we did the solvation energy to calculate the solvation energy to sort of uh, give us guidance on which one has a higher probability with, uh, with, uh, uh, with higher solubility. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, there are some other questions Sarge uh, asked. Okay. Sarge, you are you're directing that question to me or to we? It's about uh, battery. Uh, no, I thought you were the moderator, so I'm sending them to you. Okay, maybe you can. You <laughs> uh, just orally uh, uh, ask that, those questions. Okay, so I was thinking for these uh, vanadium air batteries, did you think of adding a uh, oxygen charge transport carrier such as polyfluorocarbons? In the vanadium system? Yes. No, Sajir, this, uh, this is not a vanadium air battery. Yeah, it's a it's a all vanadium battery. Uh, yeah, it's well, all yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I understand, but but in your introduction, you mentioned secondary air batteries, uh, these air batteries, and then you talked about this particular one, where you wanted to um, um, stop stop the oxidation changes from precipitating, right? But well, my question was for these air batteries, did you guys look at adding any any oxophilic uh, oxygen carriers to those to to make that redox more efficient? Uh, we, we actually never worked on the oxygen electrodes, so uh, mm. I don't have answer for that question. We, uh, they, they, we, we, we are pretty much stayed on the traditional flow batteries, which means both sides are liquid. Yes, there are, nice. yeah, there are groups uh, that are doing hybrid uh, flow batteries, meaning one side, uh, like you said, could be an oxygen electrode. Another side of your is a liquid, but we haven't uh, we haven't ventured into that uh, that that field yet. And uh, for your work with the or organic um, molecules, you, you use phenazine. Um, did you ever look at that um, uh, sulfazine? So sulfazine is the, is chemically the almost identical to phenazine, except it's got sulfur instead of nitrogen. So you got your three ben you got your uh, your three benzene rings. And the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position, the first one has sulfur in them. Did you look at the sulfur analogs? Because I noticed that you are putting um, um, sulfur at the 7th seven, seven position or the 8th position on these derivatives. Um, so did you think about putting, uh, taking molecule 1 but having sulfur at uh, the, the positions instead of nitrogen? And I think that molecule is called uh, sulfazine instead, instead of phenylzine. Uh, we have not. So, do you know if they are uh, they still redox active that within a water window? Um, no, I, I don't know uh, because we we looked at them in the gas phase. Uh, so we looked at phenazine and uh, sulfazine in the gas phase uh -huh. uh, to to look at their uh, pi pi to see if they would if they would um, make a dimer, and we wanted we wanted them to be different masses so we could distinguish the two. Um, so, but we didn't look at the electrochemistry of those, but since you are showing diagrams where you are derivatizing them um, at the seven and eight position, I just wondered what would happen if you, if you just had the, the main molecule with sulfur. And I think sulfur is a, is a Lewis base, right? Uh, it's a soft atom, it's a soft group. So it, it probably is more water soluble than nitrogen. It could be, but I wouldn't expect it to have have a very decent because uh, this field is pretty much uh, hard to it pretty much does not have much 
solubility in the water. Yes, yes. That, uh, that's the problem. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, you might be right that the the the, the one with the sulfur will be uh, better soluble, but I wouldn't expect it to be uh in the in 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 the in the concentration that uh, we can use it in the flow battery I, I would expect that you still need some kind of functionalization that's one point a second point is uh, we have to check where is the redox cup well it, is it a redox active at all first and then uh for the nitrogen atom we normally know that it's uh it's it's redox active uh, uh we we need to know whether it's redox active and if it's redox active, where the potential is. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's outside of this, uh, you know, this is this this is the electrolyte uh, uh, alkaline electrolyte window we we tested. If it's outside of this water um, electrochemical window, then we only be able to use it. You you could use it in the uh, non aqueous system row that have a much wider window. Mm -hmm. And my last question was, uh, you, you talked about uh, the charge and discharge cycle. Uh, you showed diagrams where you ran, ran for 400, 500 cycles. What, what is their charging and discharging efficiency? Uh, is it 75% after 500 cycles? Uh, let me see. I don't remember that number. So the, uh, the energy efficiency is the triangle. So it's somewhere around uh, 75. Yeah. 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 Mm. That's, yeah, that's pretty impressive uh, because uh, with the, uh, the traditional batteries, uh, you, you know, you get um, a dendritic formation and as time goes on, their, their energy efficiency drops quite a bit, right? Um, but whereas yours is, is pretty stable across the entire cycle. Right, right. Normally, if you can stabilize the active materials, the efficiency will, will also be stable as well, unless there's a crossover issue uh, one side is the concentration polarization increase, then 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 the efficiency will get worse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So actually, these are all good questions. Um, yeah. Uh, when well, we presented uh, uh, some errors, probably get a, um, didn't get these kind of questions. Different. So this uh, provide a different perspective. So because we have a small group, hopefully everybody got a chance to ask questions. Yeah. So do we have other questions? So we, uh, what, what's your vision about the, the, the flow battery? Uh, like uh, for example, let's say uh, in five years, I think uh, the audience here maybe want to hear about the overall picture of uh, this field. Um, so the, um, for the flow battery, the traditional batteries, like the vanadium flow battery is very mature. Actually, there's a, there's no show killers. There are commercial products there. Uh, well, they still need to performance need to be improved, but, uh, but from a point of view of the production, it's ready and it's being, uh, provided uh, selling as a commercial product. So that side the research is more focused on how to make it uh, perform better, maybe a better electrode, a better membrane. Uh, by the way, the membrane, I didn't talk about any of it. Uh, membrane is, is actually one error that is, in my view, is severely underdeveloped. Uh, we always use Nafion, no matter is a acidic system or alkaline system. It's just, it's not because of choice. It's just because uh, Nafion is in a stable membrane we can find. Uh, and uh, for the new uh, newer systems, the organic material systems, I think it's a very good field for the uh, research. Uh, recently, there's a lot of different molecules coming out. Uh, we first have this stability issue uh, that every, everybody is kind of uh, worried about. Can we ever find uh, organic uh, active species that can stable in the uh, for long run and uh, I mean, the research, recent research from uh, my group, also from other group, who also showed that, uh, that there are hopes, that there are some molecules that are very stable. And uh, if we can engineering it uh, in a way that it can be used in the battery, then it will provide stable uh, performance. Uh, but having said that, the organic flow batteries uh, 
not nearly as mature as the vanadium system. So there's a lot of research opportunities. Uh, for example, how you design the molecular structure, how you design a functional, functional uh, electrolyte. Uh, and again, the membrane, we don't even have a membrane that is specifically designed for the uh, organic electrolyte. And it, also electrode, we don't have, a, we are using actually uh, the water filter, the waste water filter, uh, graphite field as our electrode. So uh, I think uh, in my point of view, this is an error that uh, uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, chemistry, material science, and uh, also as well as uh, chemical, in, uh, chemical uh, engineering. Yeah, so that's kind of my view. Thank you. Thank you. So anyone else have questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Zaj. Okay, so so we also did a review on, on energy policy and we, we took it from the Trump administration, the fourth year of Trump uh -huh. administration and into the first two months of Biden. You, you talked about um, energy storage and Biden's belief of decarbonization, but they didn't mention in their uh, white paper that energy storage should be based on batteries. That, I mean, they use energy storage generally. So what about pumped hydro? What about thermal? Um, so we think about molten salt, molten salt, um, thermal storage, pumped hydro is in st storage, secondary wheels. Um, so so I'm, I'm not sure if, if, like you said, I don't think there's enough um, uh, transition metals to convert into back secondary batteries or primary batteries. Uh, but there is substantial storage capacity in the United States that's not batteries, right? So you think about thermal salts, you think about pumped hydro. Um, uh, people are even looking at supercritical carbon dioxide-based storage, uh, energy storage. Uh, so in your view, um, do you see um, battery-based storage as the, as, as the main thrust, or do you see other storage te technologies that are not battery-based as, as equally important, or, or you think they are not important? No, I hope the view that uh, we actually need to develop all kinds of uh, uh, technologies. I think they are, I'm not sure if they're equally important, but they, when we talk about energy storage, as I said before, the great energy storage is very diverse. There are, there are uh, applications from several seconds to the applications from uh, several hours. And nowadays we're talking about a non duration. For example, if you are, the Texas uh, slow storm, they, they shut down the power for, I think, uh, probably close a week or something. Uh, and uh, so we are talking about uh, if we are really going to increase the uh, grade resilience in the adversary uh, weather or in the, for example, in the terrorist attack, we need to provide power for much longer than just uh, 10, 20 hours. We probably uh, uh, a good a good number. Some people are talking about is about two weeks of the uh, two weeks of the energy supply. That's about uh, 160 hours, 170 hours. And uh, so for those type of the uh, energy storage, if you use battery, it will be actually very challenging. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but but it will be very challenging just because even if the battery it material doesn't cost a dime. It give you for free your engineering, building the battery stock. The structure also cost you five, uh, three to five hundred uh, dollar per kilowatt hour. So uh, I think all we need to look at all the storages. And in fact, I think uh, for the renewable for the energy storage in U.S. pump hydro is still uh, the majority. Yeah. The issue with pump hydro is. Uh, uh, well, we couldn't, we will not be able to get in the permit and then it's, uh, it's re request a specific location. So uh, the chance to grow that pump hydro is very small. Yes, no, I, I agree. But I think the problem uh, with Texas and uh, in the East Coast with the cryptocurrency problem, it, w it wasn't energy generation was the problem. It was energy transmission, right? They couldn't get the energy from the solar panels or the wind farms from Texas to the communities, right? Uh, because those power, those power grids, transmission grids were down. It wasn't a case they couldn't generate energy. And even yeah. in, in, in New Jersey, it wasn't that nuclear power station or the coal power station wasn't generating electricity. It was that 
you couldn't get the electricity transmitted because there was uh, some type of crypto uh, block on the, that electronic, tra the, those electronic transmission wires and they right. pay ransom to unblock it, right? So I think, I, I think the Biden administration is that uh, we need an integrated grid or a grid that's completely decentralized. And so you take out the transmission uh, problem, right? And I think if you take out the transmission problem, then your your production capacity should meet demand, right? And so I think that might diminish the requirement for secondary storage capacity, right? Uh, but you're, you're, you're right. I mean, pump hydro, we've reached almost the limit because every geological area that we can use, we've pretty much used it. There's not many areas that can store um, this type of uh, hydro storage that are available right now. We've used nearly all the mines or all the, the smaller areas that have been used up already. So we've reached that yeah. limit. But I think I think your your answer at the beginning is the right one, which is we need an integrated energy grid. And the problem is this energy grid um, was developed as the United States developed, right? Uh, all these states didn't join the United States at the same time, right? Texas joined one time, New Jersey another time, right? Uh, California later on. And the grid gen was, was made piecemeal. And what we need is like an integrated grid that takes account of the areas that you mentioned. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, uh, but one thing I want to add is the energy storage, the batteries, uh, 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 you know, uh, they are not only functional as uh, energy generation. It's also functioning along the transmission line. And this, uh, there's a no doubt is that the whole grid is being more distributed. So if you have a local uh, energy source uh, that uh, um, uh, that are within the community, then I think it will fare better in those uh, in those uh, uh, storm or other conditions. Yes, I agree. I mean, I, I think the EV the EV boom is is in California is very helpful because whenever earthquakes, people are now using the EV cars to reverse as a, as a power source for the house. So yeah. you know it's by bi it's bidirectional, right? So you charge it, but if there's no electricity and there's an earthquake, then you can use that 3,200 kilowatt stack to power your house. And I think that's going to happen in the future. Is these bidirectional uh, transmission lines allow energy in and energy out, and uh, hopefully that that will make it more efficient. And if it's more efficient, we may need less secondary storage capacity. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I agree. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I kind of actually have to go to pick up my nipple one from the daycare. Okay. <laughs> I apologize okay, for that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Wei. See you later. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine. No yeah, problem. Good. good discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Sajid. We make sure like Dr. Wang leave. <laughs> yeah, go go ahead, go ahead. But but I'm saying it's a, like like you said, a good discussion because when you have a speaker who who really motivates the audience, you know, people want to stay behind and talk to him, you know, more. So I think I think that's a good sign. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um, what time is it now? Let me see. Oh, I also need to go now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 7.23, please go, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. For... Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and we should we should thank you for being a great host. So thank you for hosting this, R really enjoyed it. Sure, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Enjoy the long weekend. You too, and uh, thank uh, the speaker for us. Yeah. Okay, bye. 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 Yeah, I, I really 